Okay, guys, welcome to Blind Bat TV. I am making stuffed peppers today. I've already opened the cans of corn and mushrooms and put the hamburger meat into the bowl. I'm stirring it up now. I melted the cheese so it would mix better. I'm going to cut up a couple of jalapenos and put in there. And then I'll get the peppers out and stuff them with this deliciousness and put them in the crock pot. As I do this, I'm going to tell you a joke and a story. Um, and the joke will lead into the story. It's one that I tell often when I facilitate small group recovery sessions all right yeah um because it deals with how we view life and we can view it negatively or we can view it positively and it affects everything about our existence a mother had two boys one was pessimistic and one was optimistic and they were optimistic and pessimistic to extremes. The pessimistic boy was so pessimistic that if the sun was shining, he wouldn't go outside and play because he was afraid that as soon as he did, it would start raining. And when it started raining, he was just sure that a hurricane was coming or a flood or anything. And so he would start packing up all of his stuff and canvas duffel bags. The optimistic boy was so optimistic, he didn't care whether the sun was out or not. He was just glad to be able to live and breathe and play. And so, even if it was raining, he'd be outside because he just knew the sun would be out soon. So she takes him to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist wants to determine how severe the problem is. So he says, well, we're going to put them each in different rooms with different environments and leave them there for the hour is as we talk and come back and see how they're doing. So they put the optimistic boy in a room filled with horse manure, a wet, smelly, gushy, mushy horse manure. And they put the pessimistic boy in a room full of toys, all kinds of toys, the newest and best things and that are out. And I locked him inside and went to the office and talked for an hour. Or actually 50 minutes for those of you who know better. Uh, a psychiatrist hour is 50 minutes of listening to bullshit and 10 minutes of pretending to write down notes on the bullshit. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say that. That's unfair. There are some good counselors and there's some bad counselors. A good counselor is a counselor that will make you so mad that you will leave that office and swear that you'll never be back. And then a couple of days later, the truth will sink in, and you'll realize that uh, points were made, and that you need these services. A lousy counselor will sympathize with you and tell you everything's all right, and all you got to do is think positively and have this Joel Austin mentality, your best life now, and never get anything accomplished. Can I tell you, if you don't change your underwear, it'll start to stinking pretty soon and nobody will want to have anything to do with you. So just as you change your clothes, you need to change your, um, you need to change your heart and your personality. And I'm not sure. <sighs> well, you know what? I need to trash cans. Um, so, getting back to the joke, they talked for an hour and or 50 minutes and they open the door where the pessimistic boy is just sitting in the floor in the midst of the 
toys and um, he's kind of looking sad and downcast and the psychiatrist says, son, what's the problem? I said, well, he said, I just know as soon as I start playing with these toys, uh, somebody's going to come and take them all away from me and so I just don't want to play with them. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a sad thing and so I comfort the boys best I can and then they go into the room with the optimistic boy is just throwing handfuls of horse manure all around the place. And uh, the psychiatrist says, son, what are you doing? He said, well, he said, I know under all this cow manure, there's got to be a pony somewhere. And you know, that's right. Life is like that. If we look for the bad, we're going to find it. And if we look for the good, we'll find it too. I'm getting back to my thought. Uh, we are inundated with a society that is me, me, me focused and not really too concerned about the feelings and hurts and pains of other people. And so by that nature, we have a problem with relationship building. And then when relationships are built, they, one quarter of them will become relationships where domestic violence takes place, severe domestic violence. I read a statistic the other day that said one in four women by the age of 30 will be um, in a domestically abusive relationship a severe domestically abusive relationship and uh, the problem with that is that we have family members who don't really think this is a big deal. I uh, was participating in a conversation a couple of weeks ago where someone had to go pick up their domestically abused daughter and people actually had the audacity to tell her she was being a drama queen and that she just needed to let this couple work out their problems and fix their issues and quit interfering in their lives. Another chimed in and said, well, I know the guy has put his hand on her, but I love them both. Listen. If you love a person who is domestically abusive, then I'm sorry to say this to you, but you will accept domestic abuse. Yeah. Matter of fact, you will probably instigate domestic abuse because the only way that you can ensure that you will never hit a woman or that you will never hit a man is to hate it so strongly that you despise any evidence of it in your life or the lives of people that you care about. And so when people say this garbage, it just, it sets me off. Um, you know, these peppers are difficult to deal with, so I'm going to use some other peppers here. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story from the point of view of someone who knows all too much about domestic abuse. And that's me. I was born and raised in Fort Worth until I was around 11 years old. And I was the Tarrant County poster child for the United Way got a lot of press coverage, and we ended up moving to the country outside of Fort Worth, where we lived on a farm. Now, before all this happened, uh, 
there was domestic abuse going on in our family. But no one did anything about it. Grandma, grandpa, cousins, aunts, uncles turned a blind eye to it. And so it just continued. Uh, my mom was slapped and beat and kicked. Now, we weren't as aware of it at the time as we would become aware of it later. Um, but it was going on. And we moved to a farm, an 83 acre farm, where we learned to raise animals and take care of horses and cows and chickens and everything you can imagine. And uh, long about my eighth grade year, things started to get really, really ugly because my dad was making meth in a real lab, not this kind of stuff they call a lab today, but one that uh, one that was actually uh, P2P based, one that was actually federal grade caliber meth. And uh, I'm just going to use my hands to fill this up with they're washed. Um, the abuse began to grow in severity and exponentially to the point that we were beaten, uh, pistol whipped, kicked down, slapped, shot at. Uh, threatened with death almost on a daily basis. Um, there was a day when my mom was being kicked down into the bedroom floor and then my dad held a gun to her head. And my brother and sister are the ones that actually reminded me of this because I had forgotten about it. But I went and grabbed the gun and I said, Daddy, if you're going to shoot somebody, just shoot me. You know, you think you would take a bullet for somebody? And you don't really know that until you actually find yourself in the position of really finding out that you would, and it's a scary thing. Um, the last weekend that we spent in Alvarado, Uh, was a nightmare weekend and we were told that we would not make it through that Sunday night that he was going to shoot us all in the head that evening and so on May the uh, 16th of 1982 we left out we left our home in my mom's little uh Toyota Corolla, whatever it was called. And um, we drove to uh, Sherman or Denison, spent the night at one of her aunt's houses. And then uh, her sister came and picked us up and took us to Medill. My mom filed for divorce and we lived with my aunt for a couple of months until she got a house, a low income house. We actually took a uh, vacation with my aunt, uncle, and their daughter to California. Partly to be able to get away from my dad's searching for us. And, you know, partly as a, you know, just to enjoy vacation. Uh, that's more water now to get that to stand up. Um, so, Everything was going fine until um, around August, I guess. And my mom went down to finalize the divorce uh, proceedings. And that evening she called and she said, uh, Kids, I'm 
bringing your daddy home. And I was not happy about it at all. And I was very bitter about it because I hate the nothing I've hated it all my life. I, I can't stand it. I don't know why anyone would physically abuse someone that they're supposed to love. I just don't get it. I've never hit a woman in my life and never will. I don't care what they do. Some people say they deserve it. No, they don't deserve it. What they deserve is for you to walk away from that toxic relationship. I'm gonna continue this story in the next video. Y'all please bear with me. Um, there's a little bit more in the telling. I do have a point to get to.